Hi, this is John Donny, and you're listening to the Sirens of Audio podcast. Hello? If this is some kind of radio drama, then presumably someone is listening. Can you hear me? G'day audiophiles, you are listening to the Sirens of Audio, the podcast that explores the universe of Doctor Who and related universes like Sapphire and Steel. My name is Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. How are you going Dwayne? I'm going very, very well and I'm very excited today. I suspect I'm more excited than you because it is time for another instalment of We've Got Randomoids. Yes, it's We've Got Randomoids. Uh, we didn't do a Randomoid Selectatron pick last time. We allowed you, our audience, to uh, pick a selection of stories for us, and we drew them out of the TARDIS cookie jar. And some of you wanted us to do a review of Sapphire and Steel. And because there's quite a few Sapphire and Steel big finish stories out there, uh, we had to do a poll, and that poll selected two stories that we're going to look at today. We're going to look at Daisy Chain by Joseph Litster, and we're going to look at the Series 3 story. So Daisy Chain was Series 1. Series 3 story, Remember Me, by John Dorney. Both writers for Big Finish who have gone on to do some incredible things, but not too sure if they're remembered as much for their Sapphire and Steel input, Philip. No, I don't think so. I, uh, when Sapphire and Steel was out being released by Big Finish, I never got it and I never listened to it at the time. Why not? So, why not? Because I was spending enough money on other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there, there was a few that I, I, there's a few on sale that I picked up at one stage, but I actually didn't listen to them. I just sort of put them away in my shelf. And so I only pulled them out recently and went, oh, I did actually have what we needed. So I was, in, I was impressed and surprised. So let's talk for a second about Sapphire and Steel. Do you remember it being on television in Australia? Because I don't. No, I don't remember it either. It was one of those programs that was always talked about. Yeah. So in Doctor Who magazine, and it was always alluded to. Um, I've got a lot of uh, science fiction, you know, spaceships and other, other magazines I, I got from, um, I'm just telling you, with it, Starburst. Yeah. And, and so it often got mentioned in terms of that sort of theme and genre. So I, I was aware of it. It's, it's been Not like that random. Sapphire and Steel's got anything to do with spaceships, but... No, no, but it's, it's, it was in that fancy sort of, sort of realm. It's, it's like um, Randall and Hopkins' Deceased. That's always got mentioned in there as well. Um, so there's, there's some British shows that always got mentioned, but I don't remember them actually ever being on in Australia, but they may have been. I just didn't know them at the time. I think Randall and Hopkirk was on in Australia, but um, yes, yeah, certainly I don't remember Sapphire and Steel. So if you're in Australia and you remember Sapphire and Steel being on television, I'd love to know when it was on, if it was on at the same time or whether they repeated it years later. I, I don't know. I, it may have been, may have ended up on cable if it was out on UK TV, but I don't remember it on UK TV either. No, no idea. No. So um, when it was talked about, well, let me tell you when I first heard Sapphire and Steel mentioned a lot and got me that got me instantly interested in it was uh, in relation to The Chimes of Midnight because The Chimes of Midnight is often compared to Sapphire and Steel, still is. And so with that comparison, I knew nothing about Sapphire and Steel and it got me very, very interested in going back and, and looking at the TV series to find out what it was all about. So do you recall... The Chimes of Midnight being compared to Sapphire and Steel? Yes, I do remember people used to compare the two. Okay, so uh, I was saying that that was, that was what really got me uh, interested in, in going back and looking into the series. So I, I got the series, found it in a video store, and got it out, and I watched the whole thing. What's your? I'll get your take on the television series first. I don't believe you've seen the whole television series, have you? I think I watched the first three or four episodes, and I was bored to death and didn't go any further. I did. I didn't even finish the first mission. I think are they called missions. 
Assignment. Um, I didn't even Their assignment. Assignment. I didn't even finish the first assignment. I just, it, I could not work out what on earth was going on or why I should care. And it's, it's bizarre because, I mean, they're great actors. I mean, Joanna Lumley and the man from Uncle, I can't think of his name. Uh, David McCallum. David McCallum. I mean, you know, I love them both as actors. And everything was right. It was set in a lovely English house and everything had it was going for it. But it just, it just seemed so slow. And it, I think they're only half an hour episodes, but they felt like hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think time was the enemy. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you know about Sapphire and Steel? What do you know of the concept behind it? Well, <laughs> what I know is what I asked you about, because even after watching, um, I, I listened to the whole first CD first again, because I thought I'll, I'll start at the beginning, thinking it would be fine. And even there's, there's the intro in terms of metals, and I don't know. I just didn't get it. And you, you still of, feel that way, don't you? Yeah, even after you explained to me, I still was listening today and still thinking... I just don't get it. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I wrote some notes. What is Sapphire and Steel? And I think it's one of those shows that's open a little bit to interpretation. Um, and it's, it's difficult for some to comprehend. And even those who enjoy it, I think still find it a little bit difficult to comprehend. So why is that? Because I, I think that it's because uh, that the Sapphire and Steel universe has characters in it that are usually inanimate objects um, or forces like time where in the series they are they are the intelligent characters so these inanimate objects that we usually think of well here they're interdimensional forces or beings um, I think the bad guy is time uh, and it's a different way of looking at time as well and if you have a listen to the extra on particularly Daisy Chain which is the first when we listen to Nigel Fares has an interesting take as well because he originally was going to redo the theme for the audio dramas and the audio theme that he was going to do which thankfully they got the TV series I think he's thankful for that too but there's an interesting explanation as to what time is in Sapphire and Steel in his intro I'm going to throw it in right here there was one point quite early on um, where it looked like we weren't going to be able to use the TV theme. So I tried to compose one which went through several drafts. There is a corridor, and the corridor is time. It surrounds all things and passes through all things. The corridor is very strong. It has to be. But sometimes, and some places, it becomes weakened, like fabric, worn fabric. I found the whole thing a bit daunting. I didn't really know what I was doing with it until um, a friend of mine, Andy, said that the original TV theme had the feel of a race against time. So um, that's what I ended up with. Mercifully, we ended up with the original thank God, because I, I, although it was sort of hampered by these rather dodgy uh, t visuals in the original TV theme, the actual theme itself is um, fabulous, really dramatic. My theme kind of, um, it kind of played around with the four note motif of Sapphire and Steel. Um, taking it different places and things and it has survived as sapphire's theme in the incidentals of um the three so far so that different way of looking at time time is the bad guy and there are there are also elements or interdimensional beings that can get through breaches in time uh, into our universe and these these are often called breakouts um or am I thinking of Tomorrow People? Tomorrow People break out, don't yes, they? Yes, Tomorrow People break out. <laughs> I'm mixing them up. But it's a similar kind I of... I like the Tomorrow People. <laughs> Can we talk about that? <laughs> Maybe next time. If they get pulled out of the TARDIS cookie jar, then definitely. Okay. Definitely. So the, these, uh, these elemental forces uh, break through into our universe. And Sapphire and Steel are sort of elemental investigators who investigate these time breaches. Um, so you can see me looking down. I'm looking at my notes because it's it's still 
even though I've written it down, it's still one of these concepts that's hard to keep in my head. So when these when these breakouts so happen, can I just through- ask? Does that mean it's a good concept? If you can't keep it in your head and you like this and you've been making notes about it, is it really a good concept? Let me just finish, would you? Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when these when this when this time breaches happen and these things pop through in these weak points, the weak point points usually manifest themselves as like what humans would perceive as hauntings um, or, or something like that. It's usually created by some kind of human emotional trauma uh, or something that's, yeah, so emotional, emotionally traumatic experiences usually create these things, particularly in the TV series. And Sapphire and Steel are sent to investigate and they've got to try and work out what that trauma is and then try and fix the problem. Now, the interesting, does that make sense? No. Now, the problem was <laughs> with taking Sapphire and Steel from TV to audio is that the television series is totally, totally visual. There's m- many scenes in sa- particularly that episode that you couldn't get through with David McCallum just walking around looking at things and picking things up and trying to work out different things and then, you know, thinking, I wonder, making little deductions to Joanna Lumley all the way through. Uh, but to take that visual program and turn it into audio, that is quite difficult. Now, I th- believe that they were originally going to get David McCallum and Joanna Lumley to uh, recreate the roles on audio, but for whatever reason, they couldn't come. So they had to recast the roles. And I'm kind of happy they did because, you know, I know you're, even though you may not be a total fan of Sapphire and Steel, I know you're a fan of David Warner. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of Susanna Harker too. I think uh, it, you'll have to not let my wife uh, hear this, even though she's probably in the next room. But I think Susanna Harker's got one of the most beautiful voices I've ever heard. Uh, I love watching her. I love watching her, and I love listening to her. I could just listen to her. But Joanna Lumley was the same. She was she was great to look at in Sapphire and Steel, and she had that soothing. Uh, kind voice that Sapphire's got that personality for. And I think Susanna Harker was just perfect for uh, for Sapphire on audio. Well, Susanna Harker, um, I first fell in love with in a TV series called House of Cards. Yes, I was just watching will... that myself. It's on BritBox. Oh, it's on BritBox. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I let the whole CD set to a friend. Um, I don't know who it is. If you've got my, if you've got my set of three shows, hand it back to me. Uh, I um, wouldn't be watching it on BritBox <laughs> if I did. No, it's not you. I can't, can't remember who I listened to, but yeah, that's House of Cards season where she's playing a reporter. And she's, yeah, it's, it's um, an amazing, I mean, I don't like the character all the time. It's, and it's What she goes through is pretty awful. But what an amazing character and what an amazing, stunning end. Um, I'd read the books before I saw the TV show and the, the book has a totally different ending. Um, so when, when the ending came with that TV show, it surprised the life out of me. So this is the British version, by the way, not the American version. I've watched some of the American version, not all of it. Um, it's a different show, isn't it? it? It's a different show. I mean, <laughs> it's got similar names and some similar concepts. And he does the talkie to the camera like uh, yeah, like the British one, but it's uh, they're totally different characters. Yeah. Really. And, and it's gone from, because I think the House of Cards is three episodes. I think they're probably about an hour and a half long, and it's 22 episodes in America. So they've really stretched out the storyline a lot more. But yeah. yeah, Susanna Harker, what an amazing actor. And David Warner, what an amazing actor. So yeah, those two voices, I do love listening to them. Yes. So with that, we come to Daisy Chain, which is one of Joe Lidster's earliest scripts. I think it may have been the first script that he did. Um, I interviewed him back in episode two of The Sirens of Audio. So do go back and check that out if you haven't heard it, where we talk, we talk about this story. Uh, and from memory, I think it might have been his first script for, for Big Finish, uh, even before the rapture. This is the place? That's it. Looks just like all the others. I knew you wouldn't like it. It's not a question of like or dislike, but it does all seem rather mundane. That's suburbia for you, Steel. And you definitely felt something. Yes. Yes, it was something old, but not ancient. Something... I'm not sure what. Steel, it knows we're coming. This street, is it old? The houses were built in 1953. Before then, the area was farmland. I can't sense anything out of the ordinary about it. 
No wars were fought here. No mysterious deaths, nothing. It's not the site. It's just this one particular house. A presence? A presence. Well, we'd better go in then, hadn't we? When you think of Joe Lidster, one of his most impactful scripts would have to be Master, uh, from this, uh, from that villain trilogy that was that that featured Omega, the Master, and Davros, and he wrote Master, which was uh, one of the best Doctor Who audios out of that first fifty. But this one probably had more impact on me. Uh, as far as Joe Litster goes, than than any of the Doctor Who's that he's done, and once again listening to this, it reminded me how much of an impact Joe Litster had on me with this particular story. So, um, just give me your overall thoughts on on Daisy Chain, Philip, if you've got some. Okay. <laughs> well, once once again, I, I really did find it hard work. Um, I mean, you're, you're talking about the elementals i mean i've seen shows like bewitched and you know um buffy the vampire slayer where inanimate objects become human or characters and they portray the character what they were but i I don't get what steel is i don't get what sapphire is so sapphire has these abilities to read minds i think or perceive things and they can talk to each other in their minds which covers a lot of um storytelling exposition which works quite well but I mean, Steel, he's a bit steely, I guess, in terms of character, but I don't get how she's Sapphire. So I, I really do not get the two characters particularly. They just are played very straight and, to me, very dry. Um, I guess Daisy Chain was interesting because it sort of explores a house. So it's a very normal situation, but with slightly bizarre people and strange goings on. So I guess, to me, it actually felt quite like a European sort of movie because I think, you know... Western movies tend to be ordinary people in extraordinary situations. And so it's you know, the person walking down the bank and suddenly the bank gets robbed and the extraordinary the situation goes bizarre. Whereas European films tend to be very mundane situations with extraordinary people. So to me, it felt like a bit like a European film because you were never quite sure what was going on and what these people were doing. So, but to be honest, I, I found it dragged like I tend to find Stefan still does. You, you tell me about how good it was, Dwayne, please. Well, for me, I, I'm at opposite ends of the spectrum to you as regards this. I, I, at the end of each episode, I was thinking to myself, is it over already? It was just, it was incredible. The sound design, because we've, we've obviously, if you know the concept, Sapphire and Steel are investigating some kind of time breach where, uh, time is breaking through or some kind of elemental force is breaking through and they're investigating they're, they're playing with sound so there was uh brahm's lullaby was was featured throughout this one as the spooky sound uh that get, that goes through nigel fairs is <clears throat> is um is directing most of these sapphire and steel so um he's got a certain style about him as well um and the the script is is written in like a lot of these writers for Big Finish I can put with certain styles. Rob Shearman's got a style. Paul Cornell had a style. Joe Litz has got a style, and um, he he does these suburban uh, families very well. And in fact, I think he said to me that the the characters were modelled on his own family. Uh, obviously, the story is not not something that happened in his family, but it was it was it was interesting going back and listening to the interactions between all these characters and and getting a sense of what joe lister's family might have been like or might be like so um in that sense i just i just love that good kind of i don't know maybe i just like slow drama is that is that what it is maybe that's what i what, what i really like about it but i think the sound design was really good too the way the entity's trying to push through and communicate talk through television sitcoms talk through ads on the television and all these things and you're thinking all the way through well, why what what's happening and you get to the end of the story and you find out why this is all happening but it's a process it's a process you know something creepy's happening you've got to get to the end of the story to find out that's what i like there usually is a good resolution at the end of the story as to what it all was that caused this breach in the first place. Um, so the, not not all stories have that uh, that 
satisfying resolution that you get in most of these sapphire and steels. That's what I like about it. Good. I'm glad you enjoy them. Uh, interesting guest uh, appearances in both the stories, both in this one and Remember Me. We've got someone from Allo Allo. So in this one, we've got the only appearance of Kim Hartman, who uh, was uh, in every episode of Allo Allo. So uh, she, I had a look on the Big Finish website to see if she appeared in anything else, and and she didn't. So I don't know. Maybe she had a bad experience. I don't know whether she had a bad experience and just didn't uh, appear again, or whether she retired. I don't know. It's partly, I mean, this is Nigel Fair's directed, and because Nigel Fair is a star, they they do tend to pull in their their mates, and and often the um, they often don't appear elsewhere. A lot of the you know, it's a they come to work for a particular director because Nigel does do a lot of directing for Big Finish. Uh, I suspect that maybe why she wasn't back again. I've never watched a lower low either, so there you go. <laughs> really? Yeah. So I think you've mentioned that before that it's never really appealed to you. Uh, no, no. My, my father used to love it, but not me. You just don't like proper comedy. I wouldn't think that, but. <laughs> <laughs> You may possibly think that, but I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I might read, um, because you can't get uh, these anymore from Big Finish, I thought I might read uh, Joe Lister's comments from April 2015 from the insert. He says, I was only two years old when the TV series of Sapphire and Steel was sh shown, so sadly have no childhood memories of being terrified by the man with no face, the haunted train station, or Steel fending off an evil swan. Last year, when the opportunity came to pitch for this audio series, I borrowed the DVDs and watched every episode over a number of nights. And crikey, for the first time in a few years, I had to switch the light on. What really works in the series is how successfully it manages to unnerve you. There's always something in it that feels slightly wrong, and it always feels as if it's building up to something, and then suddenly, when that something happens, that's when the light has to go back on. And it manages to do it successfully in every episode. So that's what I've tried to do with Daisy Chain. It's an ordinary family in an ordinary house. They're just looking forward to a night in front of the telly. And they're all doing their best to ignore that niggling feeling that something isn't quite right. So that's what Joe Lister had to say about the story. How long is it? How long ago is it now? 17 years ago. I think, yeah. Long, long time ago. So I think the resolution at the end, the um, that where the suicide was part of the resolution, it was one of the hardest hitting things, and it kind of cemented for me how good of a writer Joe Lidster was, and I really connected with this. But I don't think you did, Philip. No, I didn't really connect with it, but I, I do agree that Joe Lidster is an amazing writer, and um, as an example of his early work and where he's going to go to in terms of emotional impact, because I think Joe always writes very emotionally powerful stories, you can really see where this is heading. Okay, so that leads us to the second story that was selected on the poll by another, a very established and talented writer, John Dorney, called Remember Me, would have been one of his early scripts for Big Finish as well. <laughs> We know what you are, what you do. You feed on memory, don't you? Live on it, control it. Good. Shame, I had another half an hour in the sweepstake. I'm right, aren't I? I'm every memory you've ever had, every dream you've half forgotten, every moment you've lived. A fraction of a second behind you in a dead world forgotten by time. Never able to live now, to live in the moment. You eat minds. Memories. And what happens when those memories are gone? Take someone's memory and you take their mind. You leave a husk without personality, identity, consciousness, unable to feed, to drink, exist, a mindless living corpse. I have to eat. And then what? When you've sated your appetite, what will you do? Who next? After that, after that, after that, where does it stop? It doesn't. You'll suck everyone dry? If that's what it takes. An entire planet of empty shells, nothing more than decaying flesh? You are a tedious little man, Steel. The witless, infantile posturing, the boasting. You must get so 
bored with yourself hearing that voice of yours witter on every single day. You know what I am, that I can alter everything you think and do, even as you think and do it, and yet you still presume you can hold me back. I'd laugh if it wasn't so pathetic. I'm glad I amuse you. I don't need amusement. I need food. Now I've got it. Maybe it was John Dorney's first Big Finish script. I can't remember whether it was... uh whether he mentioned that when we were talking to him on our interview last year. But um, Remember Me was an, it was an interesting one too. And, and speaking of guest actors from Allo Allo, Sam Kelly featured in this one. So if you look up Sam Kelly, he will also feature in two other Big Finish stories. One that we featured recently, which was Return to the Web Planet. He was playing a Monoptera in that story. And he also um, had the lead one of the lead guest roles in The Holy Terror as well so sam kelly you may think he's done two big finish but he's done three because remember me was was uh, a third one so um did, did you feel similar about this one too in terms of what was going on uh in the storyline still not connecting with sapphire and steel so much so i can't make sure this is the one that was set with the film crew that all disappeared that's right yeah oh th- thank goodness okay <laughs> i was making sure this is the right story uh no. <sighs> I, I just tend to find they take a long time to get going, and there's just not a lot of action. So, I mean, I, once again, I, I enjoyed how the characters were drawn out, and I, I could feel it was a John Dorney because of his characterizations. Um, and so it was certainly a, a interesting situation, but once again, it's just a, a lot of time with Sapphire and Steel wandering around an empty area, wondering where people have gone to, introducing characters in a very slow way, and just always being on the back foot in terms of what's going on so yeah it's 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 i i know that people really like these sort of stories it's just not my cup of tea but you tell me what what you enjoyed about it Dwayne. well interesting this one there there seemed to be a a change in direction for for steel he seemed to be a bit more grumpy in this than than he was in the earlier stories uh he was a little bit harder so i don't know whether that was because daisy chain was early in the range Maybe David Warner was still finding his feet and he'd gotten more and more steel-like throughout his time doing the stories. Um, so that was that was one thing that I noticed. The other thing was that the the threat in this story was actually named. It was called the the nostalgia. So it was an interesting an interesting creature that was able to exist through the memories. So people who had had, some kind of trauma in their past. And in this case, Sam Kelly was playing an old comedian that was no longer remembered, but he'd also lost his family due to being his life on the road as well. So that particular, and he was always remembering the loss that he had. So the entity called the nostalgia, I don't think they referred to it as the nostalgia in the story, but it was credited as the nostalgia on the, uh, on the liner notes. Um, so, yeah, it was able to get through into our universe through his memories. Uh, and there was a, another character in there who was also uh, affected by a memory. And the message was that John Dorney was trying to get across. So if you remember his story, it reminded me of his story, Absent Friends, uh, where there was a, it, it seemed to be very, very personal along the lines of, absent friends or maybe it wasn't personal at all maybe it was just a a concept that it was doing but with john dorney you always get a sense that there's something personal do you get that with john's writing john does tend to be very autobiographical in his writing <laughs> and so yeah, he does put a lot of things that are happening around his life at that time in the yeah, agree so remember me is actually a quote of the creature so the title of the story is actually the creature itself wanting you to remember it so that it can have reality in our universe and it's it's basically the message behind the story is not to live in the past to live in the present because those characters who are guesting in the story are living in the past and that's where all the trouble comes from so at the end of the day John Dorney's moral of the story is live in the present, not in the past, and we won't have interdimensional beings invade our universe that have to be investigated by other interdimensional beings uh, and fix the problem. That's an important message to have, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) 
but it's it's um it's true though that's what i think that's what john does with uh with a lot of his stuff uh yeah. tries to have that moral behind the story but both stories uh i really enjoy and i'm i'm feeling a little bit sad philip that you're not connecting with it uh in the same way i do perhaps you should try the tv series get some of those later tv episodes particularly from let's see maybe well assignment i like assignment three as well but from particularly three to six the first two i find really slow and really hard to get through but if you if you actually have a look at assignments three four five and six and assignment six is a four-parter so you might be happy with that philip it uh, only goes for an hour and a half so not even i'll try uh, and give them another go yeah, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's what's not grabbing you No, I, I, I just find them really quite forgettable. Do, you know, you mentioned about the suicide. I had forgotten the suicide ending of that episode until you brought it up then. Really? And, yeah, and, and it's interesting because I, you know, I started by actually listening to the first one, which is called The Passenger, which mm. is all set in a train, and I can re recall the characters. And you know what, for the life of me, I've got no idea how it ends. And I'm, I've been sitting here wrecking my brain trying to think, how does it end? Because I can't even remember how the first one ends. I can remember the characters and the briefcase and the different periods. But so I, I don't know what it is. And I don't know whether I'm just not in the right frame of mind to be listening to them. But I'm certainly not. Yeah, I'm not connecting. I'm certainly not getting enough out of them to even remember what, things I've listened to you know, in the last week or two, um, <laughs> how they end. And that story is begging you, remember me. Remember yeah. me, Philip. If, the, if there's one in the series that I could really recommend that you listen to, because it's different to any of the others, um, have a listen to Joe Lister's other uh, um, story for The Range. It's called The Mystery of the Missing Hour. If you've got that one, uh, give it a listen, because it's uh, it, it really blew my mind. But these other stories blew my mind, and you don't like them. So what can I say? Mystery yeah. of the Missing Hour... Uh, what do you guys think who are listening? If you've heard them, if you remember the mystery of the missing hour, I'd love to hear what you thought on that one too, because I was hoping that's one of the I voted for in the poll, and I was hoping we'd uh, we'd get to review that. But you all like Daisy Chain better for a Joe Lister story. There you go. All right, that'll do us for our, our review for those two stories. Now comes the time for us to choose some other stories. Now the the Tardis cookie jar is going to be put on the back burner until next month. We're going to do that next month. But I have actually gone to the Big Finish Randomoid Selectatron and I've selected the stories already. So we're not going to have to go through uh, the rigmarole of uh, skipping through lots of episodes of Toby Hodak's Who's Round, even though we love you, Toby. But you have uh, randomly selected these two, have you? Uh, quite randomly. I'll put okay. it that way. Quite Excellent. randomly. So for our, for our December Randomoids, these are the two stories. I'll cue the music. I need some music here to go with this announcement. Uh, the two stories that we are going to listen to are multi-doctor stories. So the oh. first one is uh, The Light at the End. We're going to have a listen to that. Wow. That. Okay, great. That is the first one. Uh, I probably should have told the second one first because it's not maybe not quite as impactful. But the second one I thought we could talk about as well is something that a lot of listeners may not have heard, and that is The Four Doctors. Fantastic. So The Four Doctors is actually a bonus on The Demons of Red Lodge. So I found, I knew I had this, and I've, got the, I've actually got the CD, but I couldn't find it anywhere to download. The only way you can download it, if you've got it as part of the subscriber package, is to go to The Demons of Red Lodge, and it's there under the bonus tab. So... If you haven't if you haven't discovered that yet, Philip, I'm telling you now. I think it's just on my app, isn't it? As I just type into my app, it will come up, won't it? Well, it depends how you bought it. If you bought it as part of a subscription, I did. Yeah, so it's probably under the bonus section of Demons of Red Red Lodge. Okay, that okay. Because it is for me. I, I, maybe it's an Android thing. It could Who be knows? an Android thing. You know, what? I'm going to quickly look it up now because I'm <laughs> curious to see. Fourth Wars come up. Don't want that. Oh, it hasn't come up. So type out Demons of Red Lodge and see what happens. Really? Yep, okay, I've got it here now. Wow. 
So, how do you feel about those random, so very random selections for our well, December randomoids, Philip? Yeah, they're great. So I haven't listened to the four doctors. Actually, I'm not sure I've listened to the multi doctor one since it came out. I mean, uh, no, I think I've listened to it twice. So, I would have heard it one other time. And the four doctors I've not listened to for years. So, yeah, no, they're, they're great. I look forward to both of them. Yep. So, that'll be our uh, last randomoids for 2021. So, uh, thanks for listening today and watching. And uh, we'll catch us all next time. See you, Philip. Yeah, see you, Dwayne. See you, everyone. This has been the Sirens of Audio, Episode 83, Sapphire and Steel, with your hosts, Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Our email address is sirensofaudio at gmail.com. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and your favourite podcast app. Our Facebook and Twitter handles are at Audio Sirens. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. And when you're ready to dive into the incredible universes that audio drama has to offer, keep listening and we'll guide you on your way. Because audio drama... Raw!